that little bit of fatty pork from the overseer tasted mighty good and a lot longer when drawn from a slow boiling pot of peppered okra, cress, and cabbage, a lot tastier than as a fast chew in one hungry mouth. Savvy African-American cooks in early Virginia took the usual plantation ration of a peck of Indian corn and a pound of hog's head, midlands, or jowls, and remembering foodways from their homeland in West Africa, created what became that great trademark of Southern cuisine, delicious seasoned vegetable stews and gumbo with cornbread on the side. On the morning of the 6th of November, 1855, our travelers again found themselves and carriage in condition to take the road. Their route lay northward through the county of Amherst, and at noon they dined at the courthouse. As the roads were heavy and the chances of finding places of entertainment but few, the driver stopped at an early hour in front of a house of rather unpromising exterior. Port Crayon, who has a facility of making himself at home everywhere, went to the kitchen with a bunch of squirrels, the spoil of his German rifle. He returned in high spirits. Girls, we will be well fed here. We are fortunate. I have just seen the cook. Not merely a black woman that does the cooking, but one bearing the patent stamped by the broad seal of nature. The type of a class whose skill is not of books or training, but a gift, both rich and rare, who flourishes her spit as Amphitrite does her trident or her husband's, which is all the same, whose ladle is as a royal scepter in her hands and who has grown sleek and fat on the steam of her own genius, whose children have the first dip in all gravies, the exclusive right to all livers and gizzards, not to mention breasts of fried chickens, who brazens her mistress, boxes her scullions, and scalds the dogs, I'll warrant here, there is not a dog on the place with a full suit of hair on him. I was awed to that degree by the severity of her deportment when I presented the squirrels that my orders dwindled into a humble request, and throwing a half dollar on the table as I retreated, I felt my coattails to ascertain whether she had not pinned a dish rag to them. In short, she is the perfect she czar. And may I never bite another corn cake if I don't have her portrait tomorrow. The supper fully justified Crayon's prognosis, and the sleep of our travelers, like that of the laboring man, was sweet whether they ate a little or much. With imitation being the highest form of flattery, Mary Randolph wrote in the early 19th century the renowned cookbook, The Virginia Housewife, introducing to a Euro-American audience for the first time the recipe for turnip greens. So what's the catch? the secret to this delicious food? Well, these cooks had small private vegetable gardens of their own that they cultivated on their one day off Sunday. Moreover, they might grind Indian corn to meal and roll it into dough and bake it either on a big frying pan or as in the early days on the face of their garden hoe. Of course, 
those cakes became known as hoe cakes. Then, there might be eggplants, also native to Western Africa, and most probably would be fried in the pork fat too. Or, this master cook might coarsely break up the corn and boil it into a pulp, making hominy. So, these porridges and cakes, or breads, accompanied the pot liquor, as we call it, or stewed gumbo, creating by adding pepper, a few squares of fatty salted pork from the smokehouse, and adding all of that into the cooking water of cabbages, cress, pokeweed, or turnip greens. Now, maybe a yam or two would also be baking in the ashes of that very same fire. To wash it all down, Another West African native garden giant was the watermelon, which these cooks and gardeners, drawing from their agricultural tradition of vegetable gardens and a high starch diet, would plant and grow, not only as a dessert, but a critical water source during the driest days of summer. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Now, if you were at the rooming house of Mary Randolph's in the 1820s, you could have okra soup, a sort of gumbo. The cook would get two double hands full of okra, wash and slice it thin, add two onions chopped fine. Then she put it into a gallon of water at a very early hour in an earthen pipkin or very nice iron pot. It would be kept steadily simmering but not boiling. The cook then put in pepper and salt. At 12 o'clock, she would put a handful of lima beans. At half past one o'clock, she would add three young summer squash, cleaned and cut in small pieces, a fowl or knuckle of veal, a bit of bacon or pork that had been boiled, and six tomatoes with the skin taken off. When nearly done, she'd thicken it with a spoonful of butter with one of flour mixed in, and lastly, she would serve some boiled rice to be eaten with it. But more often, the cook would accompany the gumbo with cornbread or hoe cake. She would start making cornbread by rubbing a piece of butter the size of an egg into a pint of cornmeal. She'd then make it a batter with two eggs and some new milk, adding a spoonful of yeast. Then the bread would be set by the fire an hour to rise. Then she would bake it in pans lightly buttered. Now, we didn't forget the who or what that was perched at the head of the table in any tableau of southern cooking, a big pile of fried chicken. To make it, the cook might have first cut the chicken up into pieces as for a fricassee and dredge them well with flour, sprinkle them with salt, put them into a good quantity of boiling lard, and fry them to a light brown. She would also fry small pieces of mush and a quantity of parsley nicely picked to be served in the dish with the chickens. The cook might then take half a pint of rich milk, add to it a small bit of butter with pepper and salt and chopped parsley. She would stew that a little and pour it over the chickens and then garnish it with some fried parsley. Meats in particular were something these African-American cooks prepared 
but seldom were allowed to eat by those who claimed them as chattel. And however highly and mysteriously adept in the art of the hearth and ladle, on the largest plantations, sometimes there was hunger for the creators of food while they were surrounded by the fruits of their tilling and ladling labors. British officer and prisoner of war during the American Revolution, Thomas Anbury, stayed several weeks at Jones's plantation near Charlottesville in 1779. And he wrote letters about what he saw and deduced from observation of the daily routine of African Americans and their overseers. Incredible is the fatigue which the poor wretches undergo, and that nature should be able to support it, there certainly must be something in their constitutions, as well as a color different from us that enables them to endure it. They are called up at daybreak and seldom allowed to swallow a mouthful of hominy or hoe cake, but are drawn out into the field immediately, where they continue at hard labor without intermission till noon, when they go to their dinners and are seldom allowed an hour for that purpose. Their meals consist of hominy and salt, and if their master is a man of humanity, touched by the finer feelings of love and sensibility, he allows them twice a week a little fat skimmed milk, rusty bacon, or salt herring to relish this miserable and scanty fare. The man at this plantation, in lieu of these, grants his negroes an acre of ground, and all Saturday afternoon to raise grain and poultry for themselves. After they have dined, they return to labor in the field, until dusk in the evening. Now here, one naturally imagines the daily labor of these poor creatures was over. Not so. They repair to the tobacco houses where each has a task of stripping allotted, which takes them up some hours, or else they have such a quantity of Indian corn to husk, and if they neglect it, are tied up in the morning and receive a number of lashes. The female slaves share labor and repose just in the same manner, except a few who are termed house negroes and are employed in household drudgery. And Bury goes on, Notwithstanding this humiliating state and rigid treatment to which these wretched people are subject, they are devoid of care and appear jovial, contented, and happy. It is a fortunate circumstance that they possess and are blessed with such an easy, satisfied disposition. As I have several times mentioned hominy and hoe cake, it may not be amiss to explain them. The former is made of Indian corn, which is coarsely broke and boiled with a few French beans till it is almost a pulp. Hoe cake is Indian corn ground into meal, kneaded into a dough and baked before a fire. But as the Negroes bake theirs on the hoes that they work with, they have the appellation of hoe cakes. Now these are in common use among the inhabitants. I cannot say that they are palatable, for as to flavor one made of sawdust would be equally good and not unlike it in appearance, but they are certainly a very strong and hearty food. <laughs>